Since 1887, the Stonington Free Library has been a center for knowledge, ideas, creativity, and entertainment. It is a comfortable and welcoming community space for the town of Stonington, Connecticut, where all ages can explore, discover, gather and learn within a building of distinctive and unique architecture. This video program is an evolution to expand the offerings of the library to share directly in your home or organization. Welcome to the Sunday Evening Lecture Series, made available to you by the Stonington Free Library. Something up after a week of working on it, 
you can test it on new. So um, uh, most people use digital tools, and I did the illustration sort of book as well, um, because I used to do that with Illustrator. Um, and I wrote a book on Long Island Sound. I've lived in Long Island Sound for about 50 years now. So, uh, and I still learned a ton of stuff doing this book over the course of about four years or so. The past couple of years, I've been working on the companion, which is out in a few months on Cape Cod and the Islands. This is the Long Island Sound version. Um, and as I'll explain, the sound is unique in a lot of ways, although we share a lot of things with the kind of ocean-facing environment. But the ocean-facing environment is different enough that I decided to do a sort of um, split between them, not try to cover, the, cover them all. So, the Cape Cod book uh, will be out from Yale Press again in probably November or so. So, Long Island Sound. It's a unique, wonderful environment. As I said, I've lived along it, birded along it, looked at natural history, looked at wildflowers, all kinds of other things for 50 years. And I still learned a tremendous amount about the sound. It is many different sounds, actually. The sound that you see, say, in Westchester or even within New York City um, is a very different place from what you see out here. I just took a walk uh, in, in between setting up um, uh, out to the point just to, just to get some air. And um, it's, it's a virtually oceanic environment out here. It's rather different where I live um, in the New Haven area. It's, so people talk about the basins of the sound in the eastern. Um, central and Western basins. And they all have very particular characters, all of them unique, and all of them in many ways subtly different from the ocean environments for the rap. Um, and it's beautiful. Um, uh, it's not nice sandy, but you know, a few places are. Um, it has, in many places, uh, a really wild, subtle beauty. Even in the places, I'm going to talk about some of the pollution challenges and other things that Long Island Sound has, particularly at this time of year. But this is, in, this, this is from one of the most challenged places. Also happens to be one of the most beautiful places. So um, don't write off the sound. It, it, it has its issues. But in, in most ways, uh, if you leave knowing anything about the sound, it's that the sound is healthy and getting healthier. Um, so it's not broken, um, but it does have its challenges. Uh, I structured the book in environments because one of the one of the first things I learned as a bio major at Southern Connecticut State College um, a long time ago was that although it may seem random when you go out into a wild environment and see, for example, a green heron, and maybe you've never seen a green heron in that particular place before. But I suspect if you go back there regularly, you'll realize that the green it's the green heron's address. They're there for a reason, in a particular fresh brackish water environment. They make their livings there. And it's not random. And I, and I really wanted to try to um, uh, convey to people uh, through structuring the program and environments that um, everything is there for a reason. Everything is placed for a reason. Uh, and I'll talk about that. Uh, you can't guarantee on a particular day, I know this because I leave bird box and it's the main of our existence, but I can't guarantee you that a particular thing is, well, you can usually guarantee the plants, but um, the birds, um, you know, but nevertheless, um, they're not random, even if they sometimes seem that way. Um, there's a reason why everything is where it is. This is New York City. It's, um, it's also one of the most uh, pollution-challenged areas of the sound. It's also drop-dead gorgeous. So remember that when you hear about the sound and its challenges and how things are going, et cetera, that um, even in uh, places that have a lot of environmental challenges, uh, uh, have also, not incidentally, have some of the highest real estate prices in the world. People value the sound. Um, even in places that you wouldn't necessarily expect, like the Bronx. Um, the sound isn't easy to get, necessarily. Um, we have this sort of paradigm in our heads, what a mostly ocean beach looks like, sugar, white sand, 
nice waves coming in, blue sky, big ocean, etc. The sound doesn't really fit in any of those things, so water tends to be greenish. Not because it's dirty necessarily, but because it's an estuary where fresh water and salt water mix. Um, it's also very rich in life, which is another reason why it's greenish and another reason why it's an enormously productive environment, even though it has its challenges. It doesn't have big waves because we've got these wonderful breakwaters of Long Island, Fisher's Island, Nap Tree Point, etc. Um, uh, so some of the beaches are subtly different. Uh, people look at the brown sand on our beaches, which I'll talk about a bit and stuff, and think, well, it's, you know, let me go over here. Um, the sound is different, um, but it is wonderful in its particular ways, um, especially if you sort of let go of that notion of, of um, huge sand beaches, which we don't have because we don't have the waves. Most of the time we enjoy not having those big waves, especially in storms, but it is one of the reasons why all our sand ends up at the bottom of the sound. It's not washed back up onto the beaches the way it is on, on the ocean face of the coast. Um, it is spectacularly productive, as are most estuaries. Um, uh, estuaries, as I said, are where um, fresh water and salt water meet, and those edge environments tend to be just almost explosively productive. The only environments that are anywhere near as productive as, for example, the salt marshes, and this is just a couple miles over in, in Bar Island, are tropical rainforests and certain kinds of mangrove rainforests. Um, and, and the stuff we have here, there's nothing more productive, including heavily uh, fertilized, high-tech farm fields. Um, salt marshes have produced them um, hugely. So it's an environment to respect um, because it is the nursery and, and the larder for a lot of the things that we care about. Virtually all of our food fishes, for example, and sport fishes spend early parts of their lives in, in these kinds of environments um, because the sand is sheltered, because there's lots of food there. So um, the big blues um, tend to be more oceanic, which they get to be this size, but um, uh, the sound is full of snappers at this time of year for a reason. Uh, they come in because it's a sheltered environment where they can get bigger um, without being eaten by the oceanic stuff out there. As I said, the, the beauty can be spectacular. This is Townsend State Park on the uh, Long Island Sound side. If you're ever on Long Island and you have some time, I highly recommend Townsend. It's gorgeous. It used to be uh, one of the Robert Barons, I forget who, um, it was his estate. And um, so there's still a big house there, but mostly there's spectacular coastal forests and um, beautiful wild beaches, unmanicured, um, truly wild beaches. And um, but again, I would point out, because I'll talk about it later, this is in the uh, western part of the sand, which also has some of those environmental challenges. So um, challenges, yes, but it can also be gorgeous. There's a lot of surprising things out here. Uh, just a couple of days ago, um, just off uh, um, an important point in, in Long Island, which is kind of opposite Westbrook, if you went straight south um, from the Connecticut coast, uh, people saw a pot of 30 dolphins, uh, most dolphins coming in. That used to be common before World War II. Uh, the sound became more polluted after World War II and was explosive growth on both Long Island and, and Connecticut. Um, and, and we lost a lot of those dolphins for a while. But now they're coming back. Things like uh, humpback whales are coming back. Uh, sea turtles, all kinds of things. The sea turtles and things, and probably the dolphins too, were um, there at least in small numbers probably all along. But now they're getting more common. Not just because of this, but also because of um, there's a lot more man lately. It's being managed as a resource better. People are beginning to realize that even the lowly hunger, <coughs> as, as fishermen call the Atlantic man are really important because they're the base of the food chain. I was just killing time a little bit because I came early and was walking around the borough. And um, uh, you can't go anywhere in this Stonington Point area without hearing young osprey begging their parents for food. Um, that kind of beep, beep, beep is, is the, the young fledgling begging their parents to go find that head in the fort. 
not both. Um, and many other things that you wouldn't necessarily, huge schools of race, they don't generally take fishing lures and they uh, don't come to the surface. So you wouldn't necessarily know they were there. Huge schools of squid come in and out of the sound every year. And the squid, um, it, the sound is an important breeding area. And again, squid are important not so much for human consumption, but because everything else eats them. So it's, it's an important indicator of health. Uh, we do have sharks. There's one common shark species. It's the sand tiger shark down the bottom corner there. There's been exactly one shark attack recorded in Long Island Sound in its recorded history. Uh, um, a guy accidentally caught uh, a sand tiger off a dock in Bridgeport. And in removing the hook, um, he got bitten. And that's our shark attack. <laughs> so don't worry about sharks. Um, we also have spectacular resources here because of our many natural harbors. Um, Mystic was never a big whaling port. It's kind of beside the point, but that's why it's survived. It's like this beautiful little Italian mill towns that you go visit. Is there was nothing special about them, and that's why they survived. So the the town is very special because we, a lot of our history that uh, would largely have vanished. For example, in New London, people don't realize New London was the second largest whaling. Um, in terms of tonnage, it was only slightly behind New Bedford. That legacy has just about vanished, so it's wonderful to have, have Mystic and the resources there. We had lots of natural harbors uh, along the Connecticut coast of the Sound. Um, Long Island is much more geologically challenged, as I'll, as I'll show you, uh, because of the moraine structure. And of course, we have the history of whaling as well. Um, the, the humpback whale, the top whale, is the one that's beginning to come back into the sound. We don't really know, because the records aren't that great, of um, uh, how many whales there were in the sound. The sound is relatively shallow. It has an average depth of only 62 feet. Um, humpback whales, uh, adult whales, are almost 30 feet. So um, that's relatively shallow for a whale. Um, and uh, so it's, it's not really clear how common the large whales were. Sperm whales were never common. That's a deep water, offshore whale. But um, right whales were um, uh, probably common, at least in the eastern basin of the Sound, before they became so heavily hunted. And um, uh, it's unlikely, I suppose, that the right whales would come back in here. But the humpbacks are still relatively numerous. And they are coming back in the sound pretty regularly, and probably will continue to do so as long as there are lots of men in their man. So it's really encouraging to see them. I'm going to talk a bit about geology because it helps to understand our local geology, not only because of how did all this stuff get here, um, but also because it's relevant to current things that you hear about all the time, like sea level rise. So it's probably easiest to think of our latest glaciation, what most people call the ice age, was actually just the last ice age. It was the Laurentian, um, uh, Laurentian ice sheet and the Wisconsin glacial period. Laurentian is the name of the ice. Um, Wisconsin is the name of the period, which started in earnest about 90,000 years ago, peaked 25,000 years ago, and it was pretty much over, certainly in southern Connecticut, by 15,000 years ago. And it may be easiest to think of what happens in those glacial periods. It's like a gigantic extension of the polar ice cap, essentially one big coat of ice um, uh, on both the poles, actually. People well, don't talk about the South Pole all that much, but same thing happened. And um, most of Europe and, and Northern Asia was also covered with ice at the same time, so it wasn't just our blessing. Um, but the other thing to understand about ice ages is that there have been many, many of them. We know about the Wisconsin one because it was the last one. And um, when there's another ice age, inevitably, probably in about 50,000 years, that tends to wipe out the um, evidence of ice ages before. So we know about the Wisconsin one. Um, uh, it, we also know that there have been dozens of others um, uh, which covered New England. And it, it erased a lot of our early history, as, as um, uh, we'll talk about, including this is what we would have looked like, um, say, about 50 million years ago. The big uh, basins 
of the Atlantic coast, the Gulf of Maine, Cape Cod Bay, the Great South Channel, just east of Cape Cod, uh, Long Island Sound, uh, the Delaware Bay, the Chesapeake Bay. Those were all started as river valleys when the sea was much lower, sea level was much lower, and that's how they originated. So originally, Long Island Sound was a river valley. Um, it almost certainly had lakes and rivers in it, um, but evidence of those things are virtually erased by all the ice that came later. This is how we would have looked at 25,000 years ago. Um, New London wasn't there, but I just put these things in for reference so you get some notion of there was so much ice bound up in this giant extension of the polar ice cap that um, it affected the level of the sea to the tune of um, the sea level being about 400 feet lower than it was um, uh, than it is today, for example. So all this green area at the bottom um, that you see here, people often, oops, oh, that was interesting. Uh, all this green area here is where all the animals and plants went. People say, well, it was all covered with ice, where did the plants and animals go? Did they come from Virginia? No, they came from um, the, the, what's now continental shelf. Um, it's long since been submerged. But that's pretty much the way we look. This is, for example, the Black Channel for these sailors um, out there. This is where the middle of Long Island, the backbone of Long Island was. That was the terminal moraine there. So we were all submerged in ice. This gives you some sense, again, of, of the, the red is the modern outline. And um, so all of these coastal structures, all the way through southeastern New England, were created by the glaciers huge ice slopes. This is what George's Bank, um, George's Bank um, was a huge dry land peninsula that stuck out into the Atlantic 25,000 years ago. These were tundra forests, taiga forests, um, there were musk oxen and, and dire wolves and all kinds of other things out there. It was an interesting environment which is entirely managed. Occasionally, um, fishermen will dredge up mammoth teeth and tusks and other kinds of things. Most of this environment has vanished. But if you wonder how the plants and animals come back, it's because as the ice retreated, they had not been entirely extirpated in the area. So, so uh, that's what bio biologists call a refugium. That's where everything survived. Nothing survived up here. Um, that was uh, certainly up in this area a mile thick of ice. It would have been 5,000 feet of ice above us at the, at the maximum <coughs> from 5,000 years ago. And here you can um, see some of the various moraines here. The green line is that backbone of Long Island where um, that, that was the line where the glaciers stopped 25,000 years ago. When things started to warm up again, the ice retreated. But it didn't retreat evenly. There was a pause of several thousand years later where the ice stopped again, kind of cooled for whatever reason, and another pile of glacial debris piled up, and that's the brown line. That creates that 50 mile line of cliffs that you can see on Long Island on the other side. It also explains why they don't have many natural harbors over there because of that 50 mile line of cliffs. But that also created Fisher's Island. And, um, and a lot of other coastal structures, the Elizabeth Islands, et cetera, and, and the backbone of Cape Cod. There's also the brown line. The green line, the, um, the reason why the two islands, um, uh, Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket, are triangular is because they were tucked into the edges of giant ice slopes. And so that it was essentially a big triangular pile of debris. Um, that created Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket. So it's all part of the same system, all part of the same story. Um, so take Long Island Sound for what it is. It's a giant, incredibly productive, um, and interesting estuary um, in its own right. Um, it's not the ocean, but um, it, it has incredible, interesting strengths on its own. One of the raps you hear, especially I'm from the New Haven area, I live in North Haven, um, uh, and I go to Lighthouse Point fairly often, especially in the fall for hawk watching, 
is people say, well, that's funny, right? Isn't it dirty? The beaches are sort of brown, you see these black streaks and stuff. Well, the black streaks are not oil or whatever. It's magnetite, it's a heavy metal um, that, that tends to make streaks on all beaches, including beautiful southern beaches, tropical beaches, etc. because the water sorts it out. Magnetite is much, much heavier than quartz. And so it tends to sort out as the water washes over it. Um, the reason why our sounds, sounds are brown is not because they're dirty, but because they're young. Um, we haven't had thousands and thousands of years of um, a complex circulating sand system. I'm working right now on a book on uh, the Outer Banks. And um, uh, that those sands have been in circulation here, on islands, offshore sandbags, etc., for a million years. So their sand is very different looking than our sand. Our sand is brown because if you remember from grade school, when you mix all the colors together, you get brown. This is, I took literally a jar full of, of, um, uh, of Lighthouse Point sand home and used my highest magnification lens to look at it. And this is, it's like a little jewel box. There's so many different colors. Over thousands and thousands of years, many of these more colorful minerals will wear down into silt and wash away uh, because they're softer than quartz and feldspar, which tend to make the white and pinkish and slightly brownish sands that you see uh, in much older sand, for example, down in the outer banks. So that's why our sand is brown. It's not dirty, it's just very young. Um, Lock Island sand has an incredibly important and unique resources and in like Faulkner Island. Not only the land of Faulkner, it's, it's, it's part of a national park system that is, is guarded because it's one of the very few, like there are probably only three, um, Monoi Point, uh, Little, uh, or Great Bell Island, just <coughs> off the coast here, and, and Faulkner Island. Um, have large turn columns on them. We used to have many, many more turns, but we took away all their homes um, because we built our homes on them, on the coast or on islands, etc. And now there are only a few islands left. This is the sort of submarine shaped island with the lighthouse that you can see from Hamanassa. So, incredibly important as uh, one of the largest turn colonies in the Western Hemisphere. Um, uh, the migrating birds, both going north and south, Long Island South is an incredibly important resource. And it's one of the reasons why you see so many birds around. We have huge traffic of bird, birds coming down uh, through the sound. Again, it's a very rich estuary environment, uh, salt marshes, lots of mud flats and things. Um, it's, it's a really important larder for the birds coming through. Lighthouse Point, again, with its beautiful brown sand, um, is one of the best hawk watching places in the country in the fall because what happens is the birds come down from the east along the coast here and they hit this point and you can't see it in the photograph there but they're staring at about seven miles of open water to west here. And so they tend to middle around which is great for the hawk watchers who are mostly in the open fields right here watching all the birds go by. So um, uh, Bar Island is almost as good. Bluff Point is almost as good. There are lots of great places uh, along, particularly the Connecticut side of the sand, for hawk watching, bird watching in the fall. Because as the northwest winds tend to sweep birds down to the coast, they hit this hard line of the coast. They would prefer to stay over land um, for hawks in particular because they're soaring birds that use the warm thermals that you don't get over water. So they really want to stay on land. So they tend to funnel down our coast, which makes Connecticut and the Connecticut coast one of the best birding places in the country because of that. So I said, um, we have world class hawk watching in, in um, humble little White House Point is, is one of the best places in the country for it. Um, I'm going to talk now about some of the challenges that Long Island Sound has, um, particularly uh, uh, about pollution and sea level rise. Um, I'm sorry to be, uh, sea level rise is one of my least favorite subjects, although it's fascinating, and, and there's no way I can deal with the coastal environment without thinking and talking about it and reading about it. Um, but there's you know, so much pain coming in the next 50 years uh, all along the 
coast uh, because of this inexorable rise in sea level. But uh, hopefully, from that little bit of geology I gave you, the sea has been rising for 25,000 years. So sea level rise is not new. And it wasn't even controversial until maybe 15 years ago or so. I just, for various reasons, I just, I love Rachel Carson as a writer. And I was, one of the most memorable books I can remember from my childhood was the Golden Guide version of her Sea Around Us. And I was looking at that book um, just a couple of days ago, and it's all there. Um, the, the, the planet, she says, is warming. Sea levels have been gradually rising for thousands of years. I mean, it's, uh, it was a little startling. Now, she didn't make a big deal about it because it wasn't considered controversial and the rates of warming and the rates of sea level rise were much lower in the late 40s and early 50s when she wrote that book. But nevertheless, it's all there. This isn't new stuff. People have known about it forever. People have known that, that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is a greenhouse gas since the 1700s. So this isn't new stuff. It's just newly become more controversial than it used to be for a whole variety of reasons. Not incidentally, because, as I said, there's a lot of pain coming, particularly um, in dealing with sea level rise, because um, the rate at which it's rising has, has sharply accelerated lately. And we're going to lose some of these. This was kind of asked that you were looking at some of it the gorgeous um, uh, salt metal hay uh, fields that we have along the, particularly the Connecticut coast and, and the big marshes up near Cape Cod and stuff. We're going to lose many of those things. Now, salt marshes are not going to go away. There are several kinds of salt marshes, but that, those beautiful um, salt, you know, salt hay meadows are one of the first things that we're going to lose because of sea level rise. Um, Pollution is a problem in Long Island Sound because in a natural environment, as you may know from anybody who's ever fertilized even a house plant, let alone their gardens, most of the nitrogen is plant food. Um, in a wild environment, therefore, nitrogen is very scarce because so many things need it that they take it up very quickly. And you don't find a lot of nitrogen, for example, in the water column of a wild environment. When we put a lot of nitrogen in, because of runoffs from cities, uh, sewage treatment, um, uh, uh, impermeable services, um, uh, your lawn fertilizer, all that can lawn stuff, ends up in Long Island Sound. It's loaded with nitrogen. And what happens when all of that fertilizer is artificially introduced into a body of water is that um, they get an explosion of algae. And you would think, maybe from high school biology, that that's not such a bad thing. Things eat algae, algae are plants, algae produce oxygen as part of photosynthesis. What they usually don't bother to tell you in high school biology is when the sun goes down, all plants respire just the way we do. They use oxygen and they breathe out carbon dioxide. So you have this explosion of algae in the water, particularly in July, August, and early September in Long Island Sound. And at night, they use up so much uh, oxygen, dissolved oxygen in the water column, that oxygen levels plunge. And you get massive fish kills and things like that. These big, these are menhaden, swim into an area, and suddenly it's like we pulled all the oxygen out of the room. And they don't know what to do. They swim around. Sometimes they escape. Sometimes they don't. They, they panic and go further into the low oxygen area. And that's when you get these big fish gills. So that's what the problem is. And as I'll show you in some maps, that, yeah, from um, okay, here, um, it's mostly a summertime phenomenon. Um, and, and, it, and it's most severe, as you can see, in the Western Basin. So um, there are a whole variety of reasons why the Western Basin is very, very different than around here, which is generally very clean and almost oceanic, is um, there are not a lot of rivers there. The rivers are small, so you don't have a lot of clean water coming in there. That's a good and bad thing. They're not bringing in more pollution, um, but they're not bringing in clean water, as the Connecticut does here. Um, and and uh, they don't have that oceanic outlet. Um, the East River um, connects with New York Harbor. The East River is not a river. Uh, it's, a, it's a tidal channel in between New 
York Harbor and the western end of Long Island. But unfortunately, there's not a lot of water flows through there, especially when compared to uh, the just trillions of gallons of water that come back and forth through the race um, all the time. Uh, so it's challenged in a lot of different ways. There's also a bazillion people there. I mean, there's about 9 million people in New York alone. And probably along the Sound, um, on, on various parts of the Sound, especially this western part of the Sound, there's another 12 million people. So there's a lot of load on the Sound. And um, where you see that load is in the summertime, where you can get areas that are um, what biologists call anoxic. There is no dissolved oxygen in the water column, and nothing can live there. Um, uh, and and then what you get with the algae in these boom and bust cycles, where they fertilize, the population explodes, they use up all the oxygen at night, then they all die, and whatever little oxygen is left um, uh, oxidizes in the dead husks of the algae. And so you can actually get to a point where um, and when they first started doing this in the early 60s, they thought they were kind of How could there be zero dissolved oxygen? But there was. Um, luckily, it's, it's um, a, a number of things need to come together to create these conditions. Um, the foremost one is, is uh, aside from the nitrogen itself, is heat. So this is a phenomenon of the summertime. Um, and it pretty much goes away by about late September or so. So um, that's the good news. It's not dead all the time. But those are the big pollution challenges. The, um, the good news is that uh, things are getting better. Um, they're not perfect, but they are getting better. And if you're wondering how it is locally, everything's fine out there. Um, except in some of uh, the harbors, particularly the northern end of the harbors, where you have small sluggish rivers, there can be um, small-scale uh, hypoxia problems at night in some of the smaller harbors along here. There are Utah people that are doing research on that. But mostly, things are fine in this part of the sound, um, again, because it's so flush. The good news about the challenges that Long Island Sound faces is that things are getting better. That the trend line is definitely better than it was. We still have these spike years that tend to be uh, weather related. If we have a real hot spell, and we've had, for example, an unusually warm July in, into August, um, my wife was just remarking that our pool has never been so warm. It's just strange. Normally it's cooling off and it gets very exciting to jump in about, by about mid August, and it's still very warm, oddly warm. So, anyway. Uh, uh, it, it may not be another great year um, this year. But in general, the trend line is very good. Uh, a lot of the pollution coming from places, even as far north as Springfield, people are beginning to look much harder at the treatment plants up on the Connecticut River, uh, in the western part of the Sound, etc. There's still huge numbers of challenges. It's very painful because it's really expensive to redo your sources. Uh, and create plants. But nevertheless, those things are happening in New York, Connecticut, have made a commitment to a steadily reducing um, uh, uh, nitrogen pollution load in the sand, and it's working. So that's the good news. Um, as I said, I mean, you can look up any time here or along the coast and see an osprey. When I first started birding in the early 70s, ospreys were in crisis. It was a wonderful thing to see 25 or 30 osprey uh, uh, for the whole season at Long Island, uh, at, at, um, uh, uh, in New Haven, um, uh, uh, where the hawk watching is. It, it, um, it, it was just devastating. Ospreys went from as much more common even than they are now to almost nothing because of DDT. Um, we banned DDT. It took a long time for it to wash out of the environment, but now they're back. So there are big environmental success stories um, here. As you say, I mean, when you walk outside, notice um, that 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 you hear is the young fledglings begging their parents for food. Uh, because um, almost all of them have fledged now, so a lot of the birds that you see circling are fledgling birds that have only been flying for a few weeks. Um, there are 
on that glance, and it's just astounding. I go whale watching all the time off the Cape and stuff, but it's just astounding that they're appearing regularly now in the sound. That's a function of it's being cleaner and um, providing more food. There's a lot more man making around now because they're being better managed, and probably because the environment is cleaner than it used to be as well. But there's been an explosion of seals, especially gray seals in Cape Cod. You may have heard about it if you visit the Cape. Um, that's another phenomenon. It's, it's not due to anything strange, and it, uh, it's not due to climate change, for example. We stopped hunting them. There used to be um, a $50 bounty on seals in Massachusetts until the 70s. So uh, they're coming back. They're not expanding newly into their range. They're just, they used to be here, and then we killed them all. And um, now that we're not killing them so regularly, they're coming back. Um, just, just the other day, that, that pod of about 30 dolphins out there. So they come in regularly. As I said, the sound is incredibly important as a migratory bird thing. You have um, probably mostly if you're paying attention to the climate change heard about the healing bird. This is of uh, looking at how much CO2 is in the atmosphere. CO2 is a what's called a greenhouse gas. The sunlight comes in, warms the surface of the earth and doesn't come out to the degree that it came in because there's this warming, um, insulating blanket of CO2 in the atmosphere, so it tends to track heat. Uh, and, and that's the problem with CO2. It's um, man-made CO2. We know that from various forms of carbon. So there's no controversy about it, that. It's not the trees, it's us. Uh, and incontrovertibly, the world is a warmer place than it used to be. Um, you can argue about why exactly that was, etc. But if you ever find yourself arguing against a thermometer or a ruler, you know you've lost the argument. Um, it's warmer than it used to be. Um, and so we lost things like lobsters. You can still have a lobster roll around here, but the lobster meat for decades has come from Maine or Canada, not from off the coast here. Lobsters are not extirpated. There's still lobsters in Long Island Sound. There's just not enough of them left anymore to, to support a viable fishery. And although pollution and other kinds of things and spraying pesticides for West Nile and stuff like that uh, does have an effect on these things, um, it yeah, it's warmer temperatures. So, you know, you can get your fishermen's group to go up to Hartford and lobby against West Nile Spring or something like that. It's much more difficult for the average fisherman to figure out what to do about coal fire plants in Kentucky or China, for that matter. Um, it's, it's, the sound is a lot warmer than it used to be, and that's the problem with lobsters. Um, it also became a big problem. This is a, a happier story. So lobsters crashed a long time ago, and they're not coming back because it's just too warm. In fact, it's, it, we've warmed up enough that um, all the way out through Cape Cod and, and um, uh, 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 Nantucket Sound, and, and even now in the southern part of, of the Gulf of Maine, waters are warming enough that people are starting. What happens when a lobster gets warm is it hyperventilates. Um, it's very uncomfortable for them as it would be for us. It makes them a lot more vulnerable to diseases. And so you hear about shell rot and all kinds of other things that affect them. It's, it's not that there is a new disease. The organism that causes shell rot has always been in the environment. The problem is that the lobsters are now so physiologically stressed that, that any little challenge um, can create a significant infection for them. And so there's a lot less of them now than there used to be. And it's because the water is warm. Um, on the other hand, oh, I was going to tell you about the success story. So um, uh, the oyster industry also crashed. But oysters are coming back. Um, uh, Warren Bloom and Sons and a number of other oyster companies have figured out how to deal with the water water. And so this is actually um, was a sad story. It's becoming modestly a success story now. I have to update this graph. This is from about four years ago. But uh, oysters are gradually coming back as, as the companies figure out how to deal with them in a warmer environment. Blue crabs are exploding. Um, they didn't have any problem with pollution or anything else. It's just the water is much more congenial for them. It's becoming 
in Long Island Sound, at least in the central part of the Sound, we're almost becoming more Chesapeake Bay-like in terms of what lives there. So it'll be a while before we're like Chesapeake Bay, but nevertheless, um, uh, things are changing in Long Island Sound. They're not necessarily getting worse. So the overall, say from a biological point of view, um, biologists tend to look like, what's the overall biomass? So species have changed, lobsters went away, there's a lot more bluegrass. The overall biomass of Long Island Sound is the same as it ever was, um, in spite of all the challenges it has. So, so it's an amazingly productive environment, even though it has problems. Uh, but if you insist upon you know, lobsters offshore here, you're going to be sad because the uh, water's too warm for them now. Long Island Sound was always the southern limit for inshore lobster fishing, where you, know, you fish with pots and stuff at reasonable depths. So uh, lobsters were always on the edge here, going back as, as, as far as, you know, you don't do lobster fishing on the south coast of, of Long Island. It's, it was always too warm there. This was always the edge. So it just took a degree or two of average change in Long Island Sound to push out the lobsters, at least in commercial numbers. Um, they're, they're not extinct, they're not extirpated. Um, there's just not enough of them to make a fishery anymore. Um, if you bird watch, when southern birds um, are here all the time, scammers, black vulture is a bird that I think of as a Florida bird. Now they're not only here all year, all year round, they actually breed here. Stuff. So um, it's just, um, if you're a birder, if you pay any attention at all, um, uh, uh, you don't need to be told that on average it's warmer. I've seen this stuff for 40 years, um, low changes. Um, you see strange things, um, right over just a couple miles over here on, in Barn Island, of farm walls. This was incredibly labor-intensive, difficult stuff. Nobody built a farm wall for fun. Um, they're out in the middle of the salt marsh. Why? Because they were built at a time when the sea level was two feet lower there. These used to be cornfields and farm fields, um, and, and now they're solid salt marsh on both sides of the wall because the sea level has risen. Now, in American history class, we learned all about you know, the Revolutionary War and stuff like that. Um, it's unlikely that anybody ever mentioned um, sea level rise, although it's in a very significant sense now, because it happened slowly and steadily um, at a rate at which people could evolve and let go of things that, that weren't viable anymore um, because the sea was higher than it used to be. And it happened slowly. So sea level rise, as I said, has been happening since the end of the glaciers, 25,000 years ago, the seas instead of rising. But um, until recently, it was rising at a very slow rate, just a millimeter or two a year. Now, on average, on the East Coast, it's four millimeters a year. For us, it's higher um, than that for a whole variety of reasons. Um, it's more like, in some cases, six or seven millimeters a year. It doesn't sound like that much. That ends up being this much in a decade. And we're talking about vertical measurements, horizontal measurements, so that could be meters and meters of change in, in where the high tide line is. So um, things have been changing all, all along American history uh, in, in terms of what happens on the East Coast. It's just that things are, um, somebody stepped up the gas. And, and we're going to have to do a change at a rate that either in human terms, political terms, or biological terms, say in the case of what's going to happen with salt marshes, um, they're going to drown and go away, uh, at least those, those kinds of beautiful salt pay marshes that you see like in Barn Island and stuff. Um, not because they couldn't evolve as sea level rise, but it, the sea level will rise just too damn fast. Salt marshes take a long time, thousands of years, really, for a big, beautiful salt marsh to, to reach the level of maturity they are now. Now, we'll still have salt marshes, but there'll be very different salt marshes. And that'll be a problem for some birds like the um, salt marsh there. Um, these guys have this goofy um, 
uh, nesting cycle where you know that by spring tides there there are two spring tides and two neap tides a month where the tide is a little bit higher than usual where these guys um, try to nest out in these salt pay marshes um, in between the two spring tides which means they have to make the nest lay their eggs hatch the fledglings and have them mature enough to be able to climb at least climb up the grass within two weeks between one spring tide and another. So, you know, Mr. Darwin would not be impressed with their nesting strategy. But nevertheless, it's, it's, it's when you hear about you know, these kinds of birds, those are the kinds of birds that we're worried about because they're very specialized. They nested in these salt marshes, which are quite in danger because of sea level rise. So there are several different species of them. They're fairly common along the Connecticut coast. They're very rare. Um, uh, in terms of all of North America, but luckily, you know, you go to Amherst and see these guys virtually every day um, in, in breeding season. Um, and uh, again, it's a high salt marsh that we're going to lose because it's very, very sensitive. High salt marsh like this, these salt meadow hay things, exist in the margin between the average high tide and the, and the spring tide, which in, in an area of like this is only like an inch or two. So any tiny change is, is going to badly affect these marshes. Um, and and um, many of the birds, these aren't marsh birds, they're beach birds, but um, they're all threatened um, as the environment changes. You can see when you look at this beautiful little park called Chaffinch Park, I'm going to have to wrap up soon, but um, it's just, you can see the evidence of sea level rise here. Um, uh, uh, Chaffinch Island is beautiful, uh, but it's also weird. Um, you, it's one of the few places where you see a mud beach um, with sand behind the salt marsh. It's because the salt marsh is all eroding away. Um, uh, there used to be a huge salt marsh, now it's an open bay. Um, and storms. Um, uh, you can see this is Sandy Point in New Haven Harbor just before Sandy and just after. Um, so uh, about four feet of sand came in. But that wasn't a bad thing. That was a very, very good thing because um, millions and millions of dollars worth of homes would have been damaged in West Haven if they didn't have Sandy Point acting as a natural breakwater. And today, if you walk out of Sandy Point, it looks just like this again. Um, it's, it was not a bad thing. In fact, um, because it's a um, uh, pipe and plumber in the East Term nesting area, it actually improved the nesting area for a while of those things. But these natural breakwaters in Russian Point, um, uh, in, in Groton, actually, a, a few miles west of here, same sort of deal. Groton Airport probably would have been wiped out by Sandy if it hadn't been for Russian Point. Um, and that, that whole area around the Yukon campus would, would have sustained huge amounts of damage because Sandy um, came in mostly from the east and went straight down Long Island Sound. So instead of the normal, you know, little fiddling waves that we have in the sound, there were six, seven, eight foot waves crashing in because of the wind direction. And a lot of these natural environments acted as a buffer. And I think rather than wish our time for questions. I'm going to stop here so that we stay on time, but still have some time for questions. So um, I have another companion book coming out in two months or so um, that's uh, sort of the ocean-facing um, uh, sort of Cape Cod and the Islands version of this book. So thank you very much, and our great questions. Yes, that's a, a hooded um, answer. A hooded, I mean, but why is it that one never sees the line over it? 
tremendous to be able to build. There's nothing that I've seen on the Connecticut coast that is remotely as irresponsible as what happens on the other banks where you have these like 20,000 square foot houses built on uh, a sandbar 30 miles out of the sea that you could literally almost throw a rock from one shore to the shoreline to the other. Um, and so we keep doing these kinds of things. Um, and and it's, it's very schizophrenic um, because we know that it's coming. And I don't live along the coast. I live um, 242 feet above sea level um, <laughs> on, on, on the western edge of the uh, Quinnipiac River Valley in North Haven, um, near City of Giant, if you know that area. And I would guess, my wife and I were trying to figure this out because we were talking about this. We have probably spent in the last seven or eight years at least $20,000 that we can point to at least a pretty strong battle line to climate change. We put in a generator because once too often we said, how often do we lose power? And then we're sitting in the dark again. You know, so we put in a 20 kilowatt generator. Um, we've had, uh, especially since this last tornado that we had in May, um, we lost four really large trees, including a couple of white pines that were three foot in diameter. Um, so we really got hosed on things that, as I said, you can point to, you can make at least a dotted line to climate change. Certainly in the case of the generator, we keep having these storms and outages and things. Um, and, and so even if you don't live immediately on the coastline, climate change is going to affect you. And if you do live on the coastline, the horrible thing is the question mark, is when exactly is your um, zillion dollar house on, you know, it was just Fisher's Island um, a few weeks ago, um, looking at all that stuff and, um, and thinking, what, what if a $2 million house becomes unsettled? Um, I don't have an answer to that. Um, I look at her a lot of times and stuff. <laughs> But, um, you know, as, as, as um, many of the senior climate scientists have said the same thing, is if you're not terrified, you don't understand what's going on. Um, so I, I didn't want to end this on it. <laughs> but, uh, okay, so think we'll, we'll level through because we have to. Um, uh, and, and there'll still be wild, wild environments. Um, but there's a lot of pain and dislocation that it, it's coming. And that will be a feature, maybe not so much of our lives, as, as it will be an enormous feature of our children's lives on the dealing with this stuff. So, any other questions? <coughs> <laughs> okay.